You're listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. From the perennial studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, it's time for another Is This Thing a Fruit or a Vegetable? episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hygiene. You bet your card. One of the most favorite crops of spring is the rhubarb. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and on today's show, we'll discuss how to grow this sour stalk delicacy. But don't eat the leaves. Otherwise, it's a fabulous phone call show, cats and kittens. That's right, potential guests are busy managing their manure. So we will take that heap and help it. Of your telecommunicated questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and delicately debilitating denunciations. So keep your eyes and or ears right here, true believers, because it's all coming up faster than you yelling rhubarb and then being taken out by the shortstop right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, we'll devote at least half of the question of the week on actually how to grow rhubarb, as opposed to just talking about the funny word itself. And we'll also take lots of your fabulous phone calls at our brand new phone number, which isn't up anywhere for me to read, and I haven't memorized it yet. But before we get to that, it is time for what's apparently going to be a new feature on the show every week, the Department of Corrections. Now, that sounds familiar from sometime in the 70s. Oh, well. Laura on the left coast writes, I love your podcast. Can't believe it took me so long to find out about it. I'm planning to donate very soon to support the show. Everyone out there, imitate Laura. But I was listening to one of your recent podcasts, and someone was growing a lemon tree indoors. There was talk of grafting a different variety onto rootstock, and the caller suggested he might take it down to Florida to be cared for by a family member. Quote, here in California, we can't move any citrus trees, fruit, leaves, scions, or any citrus plant matter, especially outside of a quarantine zone. We cannot graft any scions that don't come from a clean source, which for us is the University of California at Riverside. We are battling the spread of HLB, otherwise known as citrus greening disease, that is killing citrus trees. The same disease has already wiped out a significant portion of the orange growing industry in Florida. Texas is also at risk. I'd say especially after that burst of unexperienced winter. You would be doing the nation a huge favor if you told your listeners about HLB and how serious it is and that they should not trade plants, crops, or scions, you have a large following, and it would really help to get the word out, which was followed by about 17 references showing me what an idiot I was. So, kids, don't move plants between state lines. It's a violation of the Mann Act, and we could all get in trouble and I look even more foolish than usual when I tell people to do it. All right? And remember, we here at You Bet Your Garden recognize our responsibility to make corrections whenever we happen to feel like it. 1-888-492-9444. Steve, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hello, I'm calling from Hartford, just south of Hartford, Connecticut. I appeared in Hartford several years ago, and I had a blast. What can we do for you, Steve? Uh, well, I had an adventure with my elephant ear plants. Okay. I dug them up last year and put them aside, mm-hmm. dark plastic bags. And long about mid-late January, I happened to see that one seemed to be a lot taller than all the rest. Mm-hmm. The bulb had sprouted a good foot and a half. That's interesting. And I was concerned that it was tapping energy from the uh, corm itself, so I potted it up. Oh, okay, good. And now it's taken now it's taken over my kitchen. 
Excellent. So you're calling to complain um, about plant success? We want disaster stories, <laughs> well, Steve. No. We want, you know, <laughs> I ran over my rhododendron. What should I do? Actually, I, I, I uh, you've ran done a that snowblower over a rose bush. Okay, that was good. It sent up a very peculiar shoot I'd never seen before, but I looked it up. It turns out that they bloom. Hmm. And according to the pictures, I, I think it looks like a calla lily type where you have like, like a thumb with a hand wrapped around it. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it died and keeled over before I could uh, see it bloom. Maybe it's because it's too short of a growing season. Well, but when least... I opened it up, it smelled a... It smelled Go what? Ahead. It smelled a bit like fresh corn on a cob. Really? Well, that's very interesting. So, may so uh, maybe next year. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what my Phillies always say. Um, so, what's going on here is you had a summer blooming bulb. We call them summer blooming bulbs okay. because they come from everything except bulbs. They come from corms and rhizomes, and they're the exact opposite of yep. spring bulbs. Um, you know, their right. their time is the summer. They love the heat. And I have seen some elephant ears here in the Lehigh Valley that must be four or five feet tall, you know, just in the perfect I spot. I have them. You do? Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. This, this, this one corn is about the size of a large grapefruit. Excellent. So what happens is in colder climates like yours, uh, people dig them up and keep them indoors for the winter. I would not ever put them yes. in plastic. I would get a cardboard box and fill it with milled peat moss, ah. uh, mist the peat moss slightly, and then put the corms in there and put that in the coldest part of your basement or your house or something like that. They seem to okay. like that. Plastic can be dicey for any number of reasons. But you apparently somehow imitated, um, not boosting, what's the term? Oh, uh, forcing. Uh, it was like you were forcing a spring bulb. But you probably yeah. weren't able to continue the conditions. If this had happened a couple of months later, and you would have had time to uh, let it grow until it was warm enough to go outside, you might have seen something spectacular. Yeah. So if you do want to try this again, that's what I would suggest. If you want to take a look at your corms, or maybe you should have your doctor do that, and, you know, yeah. in, say, um, April, and see if you got any growth on one. And if you do, pot that up in potting soil. Give it the best light you can. When nighttime temps are out of the 40s, take it outside and grow this one in a pot. Don't try to transplant it after that. And okay. you may wind up seeing something. I love the idea that it smells like sweet corn. I mean, you know, you know, you got to put a patent on this thing. This is better than my pillow. You know, <laughs> really, <clears throat> it even looked like a little miniature um, salad corn. Oh, that's a little real. lumps on it. That's really interesting. I've never grown. Um, elephant ears personally. I do grow uh, gladiolas and I did grow other tropical bulbs until I forgot to dig them up one winter. But the glad survive my winter. I'm not sure. Um, elephant ears are supposed to be fairly reliable, hardy in um, my USDA zone, but you have to mulch them heavily. Um, and then mm. to get the full growth, to get the full season, First, you need a longer season than you got. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about yes. that? But you need to get that mulch yeah, sure off of it. Case. Yeah, you need to get that mulch off of it right away uh, as soon as their nights aren't going to be cold anymore to give it just a longer time. But it sounds like you had a unique and interesting experience. And why don't you research the forcing of summer bulbs? Wasn't that a movie title? That's a good point. Yeah. And uh, there you go. <laughs> see what they say about that. Um, obviously, we know there's no need for a chilling period. So maybe with one of these new LED lights that we're working with and a big enough pot, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe even bring it well, in. Well, I have three. Go ahead. 
I have three foot pots, two of them. Okay. Pot that's shaped like feet. And that's interesting. They, seem, they grow very well last year, but trying to move those around is a pain. Yeah, they are. Um, but I would... So, yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, my Diane taught me a real trick with that. Hand cart. You know, when, yep. you, when you first fill the thing with soil, put it on a hand cart, lash it in. They're not that expensive. And, um, oh, boy, did that make moving my bird of paradise easy. Yeah. Yeah, I did that with a regular hand cart, but I didn't strap it in. That's a good idea. Yeah, you, 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 need, uh, you need to put it into place. So uh, that sounds great. I want to hear more about this. I want you to tell me that you stretch the season a little more because it's quite possible. And um, we may hear from listeners down south who don't have to uh, dig up their corms that they see this every right. season. But um, I'm jealous. Well, no. I mean, it's like with the Philadelphia Flower Show. We have found over the decades that you can do anything with any plant, get it to bloom whenever you want if you have the equipment like coolers and artificial lights and greenhouses and the desire to do so. So, you know, I, I think, and nobody gets this right the first time. I don't care what you're talking about. You've already had a bit of success. So now you can delude yourself yeah, I've been doing these. Yeah, into thinking you can do this better. <laughs> delude, I think, is a good word there. <laughs> yeah, um, well. But I've been doing a lot of, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of uh, planting and potting and things from seed now for about 20 years. Good, good. Um, this is the first time I ever saw these bloom. Okay, well, now you know that they can. Now you know that, uh, you yep. know, what the process is. And, um, you know, take them out of that box um, early next spring and see what happens. Yep, we will do. All right. Well, good luck to you, sir. Yep. Thank you. Bye bye. <music> Number to call 888. 888- 492-9444. Jason, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hey. Hey. Good. And you? I'm just ducky. Thanks for asking. It's a warm weather over the weekend. Yeah. Good. Finally. Uh, where are you, man? I'm in uh, Bryn Athen, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Sure. Philip, uh, Philadelphia yeah. suburb. All right. What can we yep. do for Jason? Um, the main question I had, which is, it's, it's fairly simple, is... Um, when you know, whenever I uh, I plant uh, my vegetables in these raised beds, they're mm-hmm. seven foot long by three foot wide, and you know, great. I was planting some turnips, and the and the uh, and the plants last year were you know they weren't very big, but the turnip packet, you know, the instructions were, you know, plant in rows a foot and a half apart, mm-hmm. and I I know that's probably for people who are needing to walk down those rows or something like that, but I, I was just sort of curious how. What kind of uh, what kind of spacing is really sensible in a um, in a raised bed? You know, I know that with like tomatoes, you, you want to give them plenty of space, but right. some other crops maybe not so much. And just uh, you know, is there a guide for you know kind of correct spacing in uh, in raised beds so you can actually not have just a couple things in there and it's all filled? That recommended spacing on your seed packet is not to provide walking room. It is probably geared to a popular method of harvesting in on a Uh large scale at home. And did we say, what are we growing here? Turnips, radishes? Well, this, it was like turnips and uh, the radishes were more reasonable. That was like a six inch spacing. Yeah. But you know, it seems to me it's always, so many things are like wanting 18 inches or two feet or something like that. Yeah. Who has the room? Who's got that kind of Yeah, I know. No one. Yeah. So (laughs) one of the things about these early and late season crops is you can sow the seed really thickly. And then Uh then when the sprouts come up, start to thin it out. But eat the sprouts. Just bring them inside. Wash them off. It's um, they're delicious at that stage. Uh And then you can actually get control over how far apart they are when you let them grow. But, um, you know, some of these 
should definitely not be grown in the summertime. You know that, right? These are spring right, yeah, fall yeah, crops, yeah. Um, especially yeah. the radishes. Yeah, last year I, I, I planted some carrots and uh, and radishes mm-hmm. and some of the turnips in the fall, and they were they were so good, and you know they they did so well. I tried growing peas before as a late crop, and and I and that didn't work out so well. I the, have never succeeded. The, the, those. I have yeah. never succeeded at fall peas. They say you can do it, but after you fail for 20 yeah. times, it's time to move on. Yeah. And any root crop is going to taste better yeah. in the fall than in the late spring. Yeah. Because what's happening is late in the spring, the temperatures are getting warmer and warmer, and most mm-hmm. of the plant is not converting its starches to sugars. But if the yeah, if yeah. the days get shorter and the nights get cooler, well, a- after every cold night, you have the highest level possible of sweetness in things like carrots and radishes and turnips. Oh, that's great. That's really that's really good to know that. Yeah. So yeah. there's an old rule. I mean, eat your thinnings. Um, it, it doesn't even yeah. matter what yeah. crop, but it's fun and it gives you something early in the season to put on your salads. No, that sounds good. I mean, I've been growing some microgreens in my, you know, inside the house in the winter just in the last few months, and that's been really, really good. Almost the same thing, man. Yeah, thanks very much, and, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll see how it goes. All right. Yeah, tell us. Make sure we hear back. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up in just a little bit, we'll explore the origins of the word rhubarb and also tell you a little bit about how to grow it, okay? In the meantime, more of your fascinating phone calls at our brand new number, 888-492-9444. Cheryl, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Hello, Cheryl. How you doing? Well, I'd say just ducky, but that's your line. <laughs> we can be double duck. That's uh, that's just fine. <laughs> it's wet enough here for ducks today. <laughs> and where is here? We live in rural northwest Missouri in Maryville. Okay, okay. Um, where the summers are more sweltering than in a Louisiana swamp. <laughs> We do have uh, warm summers and humid. Oh, God. The humidity. I, I felt like I was in a pool uh, just walking down the street. Oh. Oh, I know. <laughs> poor me. Poor me. All right. What can we do for Cheryl in Missouri? Well, we, um, we have listened to you for a really long time, and we actually used to read Organic Gardening when you were, um, when you were editor there, but or editor-in-chief. Mm-hmm. We... Um, are interested in your bringing the peppers inside, right. but we're a little confused because the last um, episode that we heard a couple of weeks ago, you I'm pretty sure you advised the caller to use small pots, and I think you even mentioned quart size pots. And um, so I got out some small pots, and they were astonishingly small, so mm-hmm. I looked up your thing on perennializing peppers Mm -hmm. in the archives and it said you use 12 inch pots so yes i'd like your um i'd like you to tell me what's best (laughs) oh um uh just yet another one of the endless mistakes i make when i'm ad living on the show (laughs) uh yeah the pots i use are 12 inch pots one pepper plant to each and it's plenty of room for the pepper um to grow year by year 
and they're easy to move back inside. So that's why okay. I don't think I plant any peppers in the ground anymore. I think all of my peppers okay. are planted in 12 inch pots. Then you take them outside okay. and you can put them in sunny areas where there are no raised beds, which is good. And at the end, right, that's what we're needing to do at the end of the season, before it starts to get cold at night, that's when you prepare an indoor space. And if you have an insulated area where you can hang a four tube shop light over top, you will not only keep the peppers alive to go out, out again the following season, absolutely guaranteed they will flower and grow and produce peppers over the winter time. Matter of fact, we had one of well, our that, one of our best wintertime pepper harvests this year. Well that would be nice because we we have been for I don't know five or six years growing them in pots outdoors. Mm -hmm. And it seems as hot as our summers are, we still get early killing frost in right. September. And so it seems like they're just cranking up really good because we like the peppers to get red. Right. And then we get, <laughs> we, we try to protect them, but you can only protect them so long outdoors. So. This is okay. the bane of all pepper growers and something I try not only to alert people to, but also be proactive. Um, I have now been starting my peppers around the 1st of July. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I have now been starting my peppers around the 1st of January because, you know, it takes so long for them to get any size from those yeah. little seeds. And then I do yes. not, I don't take them out until the nights are reliably in the 50s. And I bring yes. them in uh, before the nights drop, drop down below, say, 45. And okay. remark, All I've right. never yeah. had any leaf drop or anything like that. And the amazing part is when you see these plants get to be three or four years old, they become woody. It's not a green stem anymore. It's a very huh. woody stem. And they don't have a lot of side growth down low, but it evolves into this canopy um, with all the peppers up there. And it's a very dramatic wow. looking plant. Yeah. Um, in, in regions that don't have frost, like down in New Mexico, there are habanero, har, 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 there are pepper trees uh, that have been around for like 20 huh. years. Do you, do you find as they get older, do you need to provide support for them? No, because that's the nice thing again about peppers is they're very upright plants um, as opposed to tomatoes, which are floppy as a teenager. Uh, the idea, however, is if you're growing a, a, a well-known variety like California, California Wonder, I'm sorry. Um, that's what we have. Yeah, see, that's like 120 days to the final ripeness. You know, it's, yeah. re it's really hard to do that. So I would also advise you to look at peppers with a shorter days to maturity rate. The little mini bell peppers that just cover the plant yeah. and you'll get ripe colored up peppers, you know, about 70 days after you put them out. And they produce like okay. mad. And it's and same thing with uh, yeah, hot peppers. Hot peppers take to the uh, coming indoors for the winter really well. But I always remind people, what's its name? California. Do you live in Southern California? No. So maybe you ought to pick a pepper that has a better chance of ripeness in your climate. Well, we have. We we have had good luck with the uh, Cal Wonders. And so I have mm -hmm. some. We started our seeds about the 1st of February. Mm -hmm. But we um, this year we're growing some called Italian Sweet. Oh, that excellent. Also, that I was just going to say. A, a much quicker. Yes. And uh, the peppers are elongated and big. They are super sweet. They're also called Italian frying peppers and horn of the bull. And they are fabulous. And they're so much faster than the traditional uh, bell-shaped pepper. Yeah. So that's, that's where we're going. And we're going to try this year um, putting, instead of the plastic pots that over time are deteriorating, we're going to use the fabric um, grow bags from Vivo Sun. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I have some so, grow bags I mean, I, and I'm I'm working with them. I I can't imagine they're going to be easy to move in and out though. Um, I know people don't like plastic, but if you reuse it over and over again, I think it's perfectly acceptable, and it it just keeps everything cleaner. Okay. Well, we we have some plans, and we were planning to do a few, you know, in the bags and a few in plastic, and then compare it. And see okay. Good. How it works. So good. maybe I'll keep you posted. Please do. All right. You take <laughs> care. All right. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure. Bye bye. All right, don't forget, we got a new phone number, 888-492-9444. Sarah, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Well, thank you for being had, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing great. It is the most beautiful day in New Jersey ever. (laughs) That's wonderful. What part of the Garden State? Uh, I'm in Mercer County in the Trenton area. Oh, okay. Trenton makes the world takes. All right. What can we do for Correct. what can we do for Sarah in New Jersey? Well, I have a mystery concerning a plant bed. Um, I'm the second owner of a townhome, and um, most of the foundation plantings here um, are very, very uh, what generally healthy. After almost 25 years, they mm-hmm. really look quite good. Um, acid-loving plants, hollies, azaleas, Mm -hmm. some deciduous stuff. I can't remember the names up. But there's an area um, about five by five that's failed repeatedly. Um, It failed the original holly and azalea. They just died off. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a wygella died. Now it's got spirea. And they're um, just, you know, hanging on, not doing anything. Okay, now I you, got a soil test. Right, you and I had an email exchange, and your original yes, I question. Sent, I sent you a soil test. Yes, your original question was you didn't want to keep buying soil tests, and did I have any confidence in any of these uh, meters you stick in the ground, or maybe an inexpensive yes. home soil test? And um, after we emailed back and forth, I did a little bit of research. And I found that because you had trouble seeing the thing down in the ground and you didn't, you didn't want to be getting up and down off the ground, uh, the meter that you yes. chose. Well, I could not find a tall meter, which I think would be a brilliant idea, you know, make the spikes like four feet long so you could see it without pulling it out of the ground or getting down on your hands and knees. But I couldn't find it. And the soil tests that I looked at that had good reviews were more expensive than the one you paid 20 bucks to Jersey for. So, you know, obviously you've been wanting to test and retest this site. Uh, yes. But you also mentioned to me that. And, it, uh, and others. Yeah. Yes. You also mentioned yeah. to me that it was right next to a garage. So Correct. that made me yeah. thinking that anything could have been spilled there either deliberately or accidentally. And when you got your soil test, you just got a very basic one. You didn't test for heavy metals or herbicides or anything like that. Now, my thought here is you're, if you're having success all around the rest of the place, I would give you two options here. One, it's a fairly small area, so you could hardscape it and put planters on top of the hardscaping and achieve a really nice look in the summertime without coming into contact with the soil. Uh, Three quarters of what I do is helping people avoid their own native soil and build raised beds. Got it, yeah, okay, yeah. So Uh that's one thing. I also thought maybe some statuary there on, on paver, something to, you know, something to break up the thing. But if you and I right. are thinking that the area is contaminated, 
I remembered uh, years ago I wrote a story about phytoremediation. There are plants that absorb toxins from the soil. Now, if they're edible plants, you can't eat them because they have actually absorbed um, the toxins from the soil, and the toxins are now in the plants. But this has been used successfully, especially in the third world, by the second or third cutting of these plants. Um, the soil has become much improved. So I wanted to make sure I had them right. So your choices would be alfalfa, sunflowers, which I think would look fabulous, um, sweet corn, which would be terrible because you couldn't eat it, mustards. Have you ever grown mustard greens? Because you've seen them in the wild in the no. fall when all this golden yellow covers a whole field. That's when mustard greens. Yeah. Yeah, that's when mustard greens flower. And I remember when I first investigated this, they were one of the best plants. But if you wanted to use perennials, uh, poplar trees, believe it or not, um, are very good at this. And, you know, not date, willow. Willow and poplar trees. Now, as you know, there's a lot of attractive willows out there. So there you'd be trying a new plant. You wouldn't have to invest money in testing. Uh, but I apologize in the one sense that I was not able to find um, what seems to be a reliable test probe thing. So, you know, you can always check pH. Well, okay. You, you can always check pH with the little strips or things like that, and they're very inexpensive. But when you start to get into... Um, contaminants and nutrients, you know, it, it, it can get expensive. Got it. Got it. Well, this is, uh, this is very helpful. I mean, what, what you say about these probes not being reliable fits what I was reading online. Oh, and, and when I um, researched them, the pictures made them look like they were eight feet tall. But then you'd go down to the description <laughs> and they're eight inches, ten inches, and you know, six inches has to go in the ground. I Believe me, I couldn't get down and, and, and look at those things at, at, at my advanced age. Yeah, well, and, and they sell them with Bluetooth enabled, but um, those go three to four hundred. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's not something I'm going to do. Yeah, I had a Bluetooth once, but the dentist fixed it, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think when we get into situations like this, you kind of punt. You think of what else could I put here because this is driving me crazy. It's killing plants. I'm not getting anywhere. And But you could get by with plants in pots there. And, you know, even if you want perennials, um, there are what are called alpine plants, like small evergreens uh, that can be grown in a pot outdoors in New Jersey over winter and they would be very slow growing and very attractive, different look for your landscape. Or if you want to be adventurous, um, you know, sunflowers, willows. And just remember that if, if it's an edible plant, you can't eat it anymore. Um, yeah, and I'll have to look up whether it might uh, poison the birds that fed on the because I really like that sunflower idea. Huh. Well, you can grow... Um, the specialty sunflowers, uh, the smaller ones that the birds are not that interested in. Uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's a reasonable thing. I'm going to go back to lay down some pavers and put big pots on top. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, and thank you for your comment about the birds. That's very wise. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You take care and good luck. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we are in the stretch right now, cats and kittens, in just a little bit. We'll get to a question of the week about rhubarb, in which almost half of the answer talks about 
the only vegetable we use as a fruit. The rest is about baseball and fights at carnivals and stuff like that. Well, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? You won't want to miss it. And you won't. Just stay tuned through a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at our brand new number, 888-492-9444, which will remain the same until we forget to pay the bill again. Claire, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hello, how are you, Mike? I am just Ducky. Thanks for asking, Claire. Ducky's getting a lot of head rubs today. He's a happy, lucky Ducky. Uh, (laughs) How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, I am in Sewanee, Tennessee. Oh, okay. We're getting a lot of calls from Tennessee lately. Um, Now, you said Sewanee. Um, Where is that in relation to, like, Nashville and Memphis? It's uh, between Nashville and Chattanooga. Oh, okay. uh, in the southern area, mm-hmm. um, and it's a beautiful area. Yes, it part is. Part of the uh, Cumberland Plateau. Yep, yep. I've been there. It is gorgeous. So what can we do for Claire? Well, I was interested in learning how to transplant daffodils. It, I know how to plant them uh, mm-hmm. from the bulbs, but we have daffodils growing behind what is now a brush pile, and <laughs> they're nice daffodils. And so I was wondering how, how and when to transplant them. I have uh, daffodils all throughout the woods at the back of my property that I think were planted by uh-huh. evil squirrels. I also, we had, <laughs> we had some uh, devastating rainstorms. And all of the, the way my property is situated, all the water goes down um, our gravel driveway. And at the edge of the driveway was a planting of crocus. And I was really bitterly disappointed that following spring when no crocus came up. And then my wife pointed at the very back of our backyard and said, nope, they just moved. <laughs> so... Uh, so this season, you're going to enjoy the flowers. And yeah. then... And you're, pick them. You're, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One thing I learned about um, daffodils, though, if you bring them inside to a vase, don't put other flowers in there because the daffodils yeah. secrete something that makes the other plants unhappy. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. yeah. If you put in daffodils and tulips, which would be you know, a normal combination, they just won't do well. So then it's important to let the green leaves turn brown naturally. Because what's happening now, now that the flower is done, those green leaves are absorbing solar energy and forming a new flower inside. Uh And this is also the time, I mean, you never have to feed daffodils or anything like that. But if you ever wanted to feed your bulbs, this is when you would do it, after the flower's done, but while the leaves are still green. Then when the leaves Uh turn brown, and before you lose track of exactly where they are, then (laughs) then you dig them up and bring them inside. And don't wash them at all. Just let them dry naturally. And then put them in like a box or mouse proof container with some uh, moist peat moss, not too moist. And then when we get to, say, Thanksgiving in your area, plant them where you want them. Uh, Okay. This is a trick I learned from, um, trying to remember her name now. She wrote two, she wrote a lot of books, but one was called The Tulip, Anna Pavord. Uh, One was called The Tulip, one was called The Bulb. And Anna gardens in England, where it's always damp, which is not the best thing for spring bulbs. They like to be dry over the summer. Uh So she digs them up, not to move them, but to protect them. And then it's also easier to plant annual flowers uh, over where they were. Uh But she digs them up and brings them in every year, takes them back out. And in your climate, you would plant them around Thanksgiving. And so just bring them in and... Uh, put them in a mouse-proof container, um, and wait. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Okay. All right, then my next question had to do with the same process of transplanting with Linton Rose, because our Linton Rose has grown all outside of the 
area where I planted it, right. and I wanted to get some of it out and put it somewhere else. Okay. So do you want to leave the mother plant in the same spot? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I would say that, you know, right about now, which in my world of taping ahead and everything is April 10th, would probably be a really good time to take some cuttings. So you would, um, yeah, and obviously you're going to remove more of the plant than you want to use in the future, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So take some cuttings from the nicest branches, I guess, like two feet long, something like that, and then get a couple uh -huh. of regular flower pots and a nice organic seed starting mix, potting soil mix, wet the mix thoroughly, and uh, to do this in plastic pots, not clay pots, because the, it, we need to retain water now. And okay. then don't shove the cutting into the potting soil. Make a hole with a pencil or a chopstick or your finger, drop it in there, and then fill in that spot with more soil. Um, do not place this in direct sunshine. You want it to be in most dappled shade, but it doesn't need sunshine now. What it's going to do is you're going to keep that soil moist, and you will see when there's new growth, and that means there's roots. And I would probably, in your climate, keep the, the, the new plants in the pots until we get to, like, September or November, because you don't want to be planting them in June or July or August in that, right. that part of Tennessee. But as soon as the weather cools down, um, just take them out of their pots and plant them where you want them to grow. Perfect. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you so much. That's yeah. a huge help to me. Uh, yeah, those are, you know, those are remarkable plants. You can't kill them. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. I sure enjoy your program. Well, thank you so much, and you take care. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. As is inevitable, it is time for the question of the week, which we're calling, Hey Rube, where's the rhubarb? Krista in Telford, PA writes, apparently rhubarb is the easiest thing in the world for anybody to grow but me. I was told to mix my existing soil with mushroom soil, which I did, watered it well, and after 45 days it starts to wilt and just dies. I spend quite a bit on rhubarb every spring in the grocery store and just love it. But I have no luck growing it. Please help. <clears throat> Before we answer the question directly, let's discuss the fascinating word, rhubarb. I had learned back at Temple University's School of Communications and Theater that the word is used to help audiences imagine a great number of people milling about. If we're talking about a stage play, everyone not on the stage would gather right behind the set and mumble rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb over and over. If it was radio, everyone not on the air would fill the room and do the same thing. Then I heard it used differently at a traveling carnival when a large group of townies was roaming around the midway looking for trouble. The guy working the crooked milk bottle game yelled, hey, Rube! and the crowd was quickly outnumbered by the show's acrobats and roustabouts. Years later, I was able to use this magical phrase to make sure the carnies knew I was on their side when trouble began to fester near the tilt-a-whirl on a hot and humid Saturday night. Then, doing more research than any sane person would deem necessary, I discovered that this tactic dated back to ancient Greek theater when actors on stage would warn their fellow thespians that a disruptive crowd was in the audience, using a word that loosely meant barbarians and which eventually morphed into rhubarb. Now, I can't remember when I first heard it used to describe a fight on the baseball field, but the Phillies were my hometown team, and it probably happened when I was darn young, as their nickname was the Fightin' Phils, and we had at least two pitchers in the bullpen whose only job was to throw at people who had ticked us off, thrown at one of our guys, or we just felt like it. This phrase classically describes what occurs when a member of the opposite team physically attacks an opposing player. 
as done after a hard takeout slide, or when a sissy batter takes umbrage at a pitch that would have taken his head off had he not dropped down into the tobacco juice stained dirt. If he then starts marching towards the mound with bat still in hand, a rhubarb ensues. Hall of Fame broadcaster Red Barber is credited with first using the term. At any rate, the rhubarb now under discussion is the only vegetable we eat like a fruit. It is related to buckwheat, loves cold winters, rich soil, and for its roots to be divided every five years or so. Planted in the fall, root divisions will produce many edible spears by year three. Now be sure to wait until those stems are a bright cherry red before harvesting and trim off every bit of the poisonous leaves before mixing the chopped up stems with an inordinate amount of sugar to make a rhubarb pot. You should harvest by twisting the stalks off with your hands, not using a knife. And be patient when picking. The brighter red the color, the better this foul fruit will taste. Do not harvest at all the first year, and maybe try a few stems the second year. Every year thereafter should bring a better harvest until year five when the plant must be divided. This is when you might be able to acquire local planting stock if you can find another rhubarb grower about to divide their clump nearby. Remember, we're always planting this crop in the fall, not the spring, and always leave half of the spears unharvested to capture sunlight to fuel the following year's crop just like that other perennial vegetable, asparagus. A notorious heavy feeder, rhubarb is typically planted in full sun in an area with good drainage in soil that is rich with completely composted horse manure. Because it is kind of a grain, like its cousin buckwheat, it wants a lot of nitrogen and not much else. That's why the classic rhubarb food has always been well-composted horse manure, not fresh. Poultry manure should also work well. Now, some varieties can set seed, which is bad. If you see seeds setting, say that five times real fast, cats and kittens, cut them off. They'll just rob energy from the root system. Now, that leaves us with our listener's choice of, quote, mushroom soil for the original planting material. A locally available resource in southeastern Pennsylvania, the mushroom growing capital of the world, mushroom soil can either be fresh, right out of the mushroom house and hot as Hades, or aged when it is allowed to cook down until it is cooler and less offensive to the olfactory senses. Fresh mushroom soil could easily burn new plants. And, quote, conventional mushroom soil could well have been treated with herbicides during the growing phase and or fungicides at the end to ensure that you don't become an accidental mushroom competitor. Aged mushroom soil from an organic supplier would be a good choice, but completely composted horse or poultry manure is much more available and a better choice for rhubarb. Hey, Rube, yo, come on, Charlie, there's a rhubarb. Hey, safe, get out. He was safe. He was out. Safe, he never tagged him with the ball. You idiot, he was out when he ran out of the base on the base. All right, I've had enough, you're out of here. What do you mean? You can't go when I'm far out of the game. Yeah. All right, you're out of here. Even the guy running the scoreboard up there says he was out, and he's way up there in the mezzanine. Hey. Well, that sure was some interesting information about rhubarb, now wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website to read it over at your leisure or your leisure. Just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you will always find the latest question of the week where? At the Gardens Alive website. Yikes, my producer is threatening to ruin my rhubarb. If I don't get out of this studio, we must be out of time. But you can contact us anytime at our brand new phone number, 888-492-9444, which is still working. Yay, we said we'd pay that bill. 
or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at YBYG at WLVT.org. Please, please include your location. You'll find all of this contact information and information on my upcoming virtual public appearance on Tuesday, April 6th at our website, YouBetYourGarden.org, where you'll also find the answers to like 6,000 of your garden questions, audio of this show, video of this show, audio and video of previous shows, and our podcast. Ah, wow. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all produced and delivered to you weekly by Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when a scientific probe meant to simply observe life on Mars became a transmitter to Earth, and he became stranded here, obsessed with Bugs Bunny cartoons and Oreos. Ken Queter plays our theme music. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our sound engineer is Jersey boy Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Please check out her fine work at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Tavia Minnick is our peerless princess of profound production. The always lovely Jonas Bowen is our audio editor. Judicious Jake Boyer does the video. Our directorial director of direction is the harassed and harried Javier Diaz. Andy Cummins continues to take our temperature at the door. Zach the Tack Wisniewski, formerly known as that snotty kid on the rifleman, escaped the world of black and white television and now hangs out here, regrettably calling anything he sees pa, including the vending machine. He is ably assisted by the usual gang of idiots, including Eric Werner, Jacob Morris, Jeff Frederick, and many more too expensive to mention. I'm your host, Mike McGrath. It seems that our beloved CEO, Tim Fallon, has received the COVID vaccine ahead of me. Apparently, I'm on the list right after mimes, household pets, and old jello boxes. So wear a mask, wash your hands, stay safe, and make sure I can see you again next week. You've been listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden.